So one of the first things I do every morning is I wake up and I come into this room, my office, and right behind this chalkboard, I have a mat. And I kneel down on my mat, I put a meditation pillow under my butt, and I prepare to pray. Well, today, as I began my opening prayers, I noticed I don't feel relaxed. I don't feel present with my prayers. My mind was going somewhere else. And so immediately I scanned my body to figure out, well, am I holding anything back from being totally present? And the very first thing I noticed is that I was squinting my eyes and furrowing my brow. So as I'm sitting there trying to be present with the Lord, I'm digging in with my eyebrows. And so, of course, I noticed that, and because I became conscious of it, I was able to relax it. Let my eyebrow, eyebrows raise up, relax my forehead, my eyes, everything began to feel relaxed here. And then immediately, almost instantly, as I relaxed my eyes, my shoulders dropped. I didn't know my shoulders were up, but once I relaxed my eyebrows, my eyes, my shoulders dropped. As I dropped my shoulders, my belly expanded. So it was almost as if my shoulders were holding up my rib cage and my solar plexus was unable to relax, and thus my belly was held tight. As I opened my brow, relaxed my shoulders, dropped my belly, also noticed that my butt was held tight. And so as I relaxed my pelvic floor, all of my legs softened and I was able to really sink into that kneeling position and be present for my prayers. Now, the reason why I tell you this short story is because you may have heard me use the term neurotic holding patterns in old videos that I've done when I was presenting these types of ideas. A neurotic holding pattern is just like it sounds. Neurotic, neurosis, nervous system, right? Something of the brain and the nervous system holding something in a particular pattern. We all have different patterns, but there are patterns of patterns, and today we're going to talk about those patterns. And Wilhelm Reich, who was a founder of bioenergetics, and we've been talking quite a bit about him and the ideas that have come from his work, and including Alexander Lowen, called these neurotic holding patterns muscular armoring. And you could just imagine what an armor would be like, right? It would be tense, it would be tight, it would be protective. Because Wilhelm Reich asserted that our body took on our predominant mental defense mechanisms. So when you have a mental de defense mechanism, meaning a way that you go about life with strategies that protect you from seeming threats, perceived threats, actual threats in your environment, it doesn't just happen as a mental strategy. It also manifests itself physically. And you know this is true because if you ever find yourself in a fearful situation, maybe you're walking down the street and somebody who maybe you're afraid of, right? And you see this guy, it's like, oh man, maybe. Immediately, your breathing's going to change. Immediately, your body is going to take on that defensive posture. Your shoulders might come up, your belly might tighten, your adrenaline will go up, right? So it's not just the muscles, but also the organs will change. Your breathing may become more shallow, like I said before, or it may deepen. Your eyes may dilate. So this perceived threat, right? Whether it's a threat or not, it doesn't matter, but what we perceive then makes itself present in an acute response within the body. Now, what makes neurotic holding patterns or muscular armoring so important to our discussion is that they become chronic. A muscular pattern or a neuronic holding pattern or a response to a threat can become patterned into our personality. And that's how we get the character structure, shapes, or what I've been calling neosomatotypes that we've been talking about in previous videos. Neosomatotypes are character structures or our posture that takes on our predominant psychological predisposition is the chronic holding that is, I guess you could say, left over or it becomes unconscious, it becomes patterned into our habitual nature from an acute response or a trauma. Oftentimes, uh, a lot of these become patterned into our bodies and 
it's a result of a shocking experience that we have as a child, especially pre-Oedipal. The other day we spoke about the neo-somatotypes and those that happen, you know, the majority of them that start to take form are before the age of four. Pre-egoic, people would say, or pre-Oedipal, using Freud's terms. So a, an experience of being shamed will activate certain, what we're gonna call, straps or segments. I'm gonna get to this in a moment. Just kind of setting you guys up for what we want to do here because what we want to understand here because this is actively present in our lives. And as you're sitting here right now, I would invite you even to scan your body and notice are there any areas that you're holding tight? I know I do. I know my predominant holding patterns. I know that I hold it right here, right? I do a lot of this, right? And thus, I have experienced through life vision problems. Vision problems, did you know? Vision problems are a result of neurotic holding patterns or faulty recruitment patterns of the muscles within the ocular segment. That means that if you have nearsightedness or farsightedness, that they can be healed naturally, which has been demonstrated by the work of uh, Bates. I forget his name, something Bates, Master Bates. Something Bates. Uh, the Bates method you could look into. And I've even hired some coaches to help me work with my ocular segment. Well, I still have nearsightedness. And so <laughs> working on it. Tough one because this, this area, as you'll discover late, uh, soon, is highly charged. Also, I know that I have a holding within my solar plexus. I actually feel it. It gets tense and tight, especially if I'm anxious or drank too much coffee, <laughs> right? I'll feel it. I'll feel a tension, a cutting off right here. I also notice not so much these days, but in the past, a pulling up of my pelvic floor. I'll notice shoulders hiked up. I'll notice feet being held. And when I say notice, it's because I'm doing it, but I don't know I'm doing it. And the more we become conscious that we're doing it, the more control we can have over it. But as you're sitting there, take notice what's happening in your body that you're not aware of. And some of it becomes so unconscious that we can't even become conscious of it because it's below the level of feeling. And so it takes on a rigid, or sort of rigidifies itself into your physiology and it becomes your posture. So this is just sort of an overview of or, or a different angle, a different way of looking at what we have been speaking about in terms of pulsation and how the body is a uh, open system. And when we, when that open system takes in stimuli and responds to it or reacts to it and it becomes chronic, it shapes our body. And that's how we, that's how we get the ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph, or according to Riken Young, or Riken um, Lowen, schizoid, oral, masochist, psychopath, rigid, right? Well, we try to stay away from those language, that language here because number one, I'm not a psychotherapist and I'm not trying to psychoanalyze anybody. And number two, because it pathologizes what every single one of us are. There's not a single human being that is of pure openness, pure frequency. Christians believe that was Jesus Christ. He was free from sin, holding patterns, neurotic holding patterns, free from muscular armoring, right? That's, and that's the prototype, prototypical human being that we can all aspire to, free from this holding back of being, from being our strongest selves. Interestingly enough, a lot of time, religion causes a lot of this holding to happen because of shame and so forth. But, so... That gives you an overview. Let's dive in. Let's talk about these straps. So Wilhelm Reich, as I mentioned before, talked about muscular armoring. And he said that we have bands of muscular tension. He discovered there were seven of them. Now, remember, he did his work in the 1920s and he really, 1920s, 1930s, and he really, being a part of the psychoanalytic community uh, and society with, with Freud, they were really trying their best 
to medicalize psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and psychology. Uh, and it worked, because you kind of have that today. Psychology is sort of a pseudo-medicine, right? Uh, the reason why I don't say pseudo-medicine in a derogatory way, it's because it's sort of a science of the soul. And if you think you're going to pin down a soul with, um, uh, you'd say like, uh, you know, un irrefutable scientific evidence, well then, good luck. Because we're a little bit more slippy than that, slippery than that. That's like trying to hold water with your hand. It's like, well, I, I got some of it, but you know, it's gonna slip out. So psychology could never really be a science in the Western way of things, or the way that most people think of it. Empirical, empirical is that the word I was looking for? So he tried his best to stay away from woo-woo language. You know what I mean by woo-woo language, right? He tried to stay away from chi, right? He tried to stay away from prana, right? And these are terms that were making their, making their way into Western culture just very little bit at that time. By the 1960s, it was full blown. Uh, you know, they, they called it the, 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 the spiritual revolution by the 1960s, but he was way ahead of his time. And even still then, he knew of these Eastern concepts, but he was a Western, scientific, rigorous man. He wanted to maintain scientific rigor. And so he used different terms, terms he made up himself. We're not going to get into um, orgone, but that's what he called it. He called it orgone. Orgone, right? That's the, that's the animating pulsation in the universe, right? The frequency of life, right? You know, and so it's tough. But prior to anyone ever asserting or him wanting to adopt the idea that chakras exist, he noticed scientifically through observation and repetitive uh, affirmation or confirmation that there were these bands of muscular tension. And these bands would respond to different mental stimuli. So let's back up for a moment. Let's just talk about these bands. Because as we go deeper into the, these bands, they cut off certain parts of our body that are, that are considered segments. And each one of these segments has a nerve plexus or cortex that's associated with it, certain ganglia. And then, you know, you have the nerve innervations that are, uh, they, they, they work with the organs and the muscles. The term is, um, uh, I can't remember the, the term, somatic, somatic something. Visceral somatic, viscera, right? Organ somatic muscular. So anyway, let's talk about these straps real quick here because, you know, I, I want to also avoid uh, going down the woo-woo route, right? Like it's, and, and not because the woo-woo route is wrong. It's because language, once again, can get us in trouble. And there are certain associations with certain terms that even if you're talking about the same thing and you use it, people will cringe or shut you out. And so I'm trying to do this here from a perspective that is, is, is most aptly related to the anatomy and physiology of exercise, right? I'm an exercise coach. And we're talking about these things that are associated with the muscular system, but we can't talk about the muscular system without talking about the organs and the brain and the nervous system that's all associated with it. So that being said, I have references, um, you know, for what it's worth. I'm going to be reading briefly about these bands from The Endless Web, uh, Facial Anatomy and Physical Reality by uh, Dr. Lou Schultz and Mary Fettis. So uh, we're in chapter 12. And so he's talking about individual variations of contour with people. When we, when we spoke about how the, the shape is formed in each one of those neosomatotypes, that's what he's referring to. So besides individual variation in contour, there are also patterns that are more or less common to all bodies. These patterns appear as straps, bands that we see running horizontally around the body, almost like retaining belts in the soft tissue. And so uh, he's gonna be, he's referring to this diagram here. And so I tried my best to recreate that. So, he says that these are relatively independent of the muscle anatomy of the body, right? So they're not muscles, they're more like fascia. 
They are unexpected and unexplained, but they are visible soft tissue structures. So they're there. The contour patterns we discuss in this section are a series of seven such bands. As we describe these individually, we talk more about what they imply about both movement and behavior. Straps represent a functional connecting structure through the body where there are no traditional anatomical connections from front to back. We describe the straps as being just under the skin because that's where we observe them. As the body moves, they seem, however, to go all the way through as well as around the surface. They may be visualized as planes through the body. These straps on the surface of the body are similar in function to the armor of an armadillo. The segmentation of the armor holds each part rigid with respect to the neighboring section while nevertheless permitting some movement. Similarly, in the human body, the straps preserve external structure, preventing too deep an infolding as the body bends. To some degree, this is probable, probably an effective way of shortening ourselves up or shoring ourselves up, right? They kind of hold us together. It is a pattern we see in all human beings. Straps seem to arise in much the same way as tendons and ligaments, which they appear to resemble in structure. The telltale sign of the presence of a strap is a flattening or depression running horizontally through the body surface. It may be continuous or interrupted like a dotted line. What defines these are restrictive bands that are inflexible. They break the flow of movement. So if you remember when I was talking about the earthworm, now the earthworm has segments also, if you look at a worm, it has these it has bands, right? And the earthworm will, it's all of its locomotive capacity happens through a pulsation that goes through it, right? A pulsation. So it just, as it flexes each one of these segments, right? Because now we're talking about segments. These are straps. These are segments. As it move, as, as these segments sort of flex, it's almost a pulsation that goes through it it can move. We as human beings still have in our structure a worm-like thing. We're kind of, we're not like worms, don't get me wrong, but we have that peristaltic movement that happens most aptly and evidently in our inner tube. You drink water, what, what happens? Right? And then it happens all through the digestive tract. So we almost have like an inner worm, right? And, the, and the, everything on the outside encases it so that pulsation still should happen, especially as we're breathing, right? There's a pulsation that happens in the body, right? Now, that pulsation can be interrupted by neurotic holding patterns within these segments and within these straps. So we have seven of them. I'm gonna point out real quick what I think. They, they, they say that the chest band is the most uh, evident. It's the first one that they start with. They say the most obvious strap evident in almost everyone is a horizontal depression mid chest. So it's like right under your boobs, right? Right under your boobs. Uh, horizontal depression just below the nipples. Seen from the front, this is located the junction of the upper insertion of the rectus abdominis, right? So on and so forth. So this one is pretty evident. It's usually pretty obvious. The one that is like when someone's fat, you ever see like women, won't bend too, but like where the belly kind of stops and then like it hangs over. You ever notice that? You ever notice that like, you know, somebody who's got fat, like the, the accumulates, but then, then there's a break and you can almost see it. Like it's, I'm not going to undress myself right now, but right down below, like, like, like your hip band, that one is so obvious. It's so evident to me. You just look at somebody and it's just like, that's where it, and it sort of swoops under the belly. Well, that's where it breaks right there. Right. But then we have it. I feel them in my pubic segment, meaning like in the groin, right? Like between like this area of the legs, right? Where the, where the, uh, hip joint, or I guess the femur g gets uh, articulated with the pelvis, right? That junction there. And so there's that there. And then, so that's a, that's a pubic. We have the inguinal, like I just mentioned there, which is below the belly. Right across the belly button, 
You almost like you can see it with some people, like if they're really lean and then like bend over, you'll just see like a strap right across the belly button, like maybe right above. This one is, this one can move. This one is not exactly at the belly button, but it's, you know, somewhere in the belly area, umbilical. Chest, we talked about right here, boom. The collar, the throat, there's another band here, right? Boom, and this one, this is another one, I didn't mention it before, but this is another, another one where I notice I get a lot of tension. Because if I'm not, and all, we'll talk about diaphragms in another video, but if this diaphragm's not relaxed, then this one suffers. And so I, I'm often not relaxed here. I'm sorry, yeah, right here, like solar plexus in this area. And so because sound, we're sound makers, right? And we make sound through vibration. All sound is vibration. And in order for that vibration to come out, something has to vibrate within. And we call those diaphragms. And so in order for this diaphragm to be fully functional, the diaphragms below it need to, right? We, it sort of works this way. So you got the pelvic diaphragm, you have the solar plexus diaphragm, right? And then you have the diaphragm in your throat. And so tension in the collar and the throat will be evident in pitch of your voice, right? And so later on, I'm gonna be, do, I'll do lessons on you know, how to work with all of this, but one of the things that you can, you can do if you find that you have tension in the collar is uh, singing, toning. Do, 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 re, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So anyway, singing, right, singing. Uh, and you know, prior to things turning weird, um, <laughs> things that ever not been weird, there was a time when it was very manly to sing, right? It was very, if you were a man that knew how to sing, that was, uh, was considered very manly. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I think we are turned away from, I don't know for sure, but it almost seems like, oh, glee club just sounds kind of glee-ish. Anyway, chin, chin strap right here. This, and then that also associated with the ears, and then it goes right back to the, right below the occipital bone, right? Suboccipital. So here, boom, here. And Wilhelm, according to Wilhelm Reich, this band, the chin band, holds the most tension in the whole body. You can just imagine, I mean, like, it's associated with eating, it's associated with speaking, it's associated with kissing, it's the first place we reach out, right? Where we receive, where we reach, I mean, the mouth is huge, right? I, I, nobody's born without a mouth, right? A mouth and a butthole, everybody's got one. So, but this is, this one and this one, I mean, they're all, they're very connected. I remember studying a course from Paul Check and he talked about how the atlas and, and the, uh, the S, was S S1 through L5? Right, the sacrum, the sacrum, and the and the uh, or yeah, so it's below the uh, the lumbar, the sacrum, and the atlas work together, and that's why if you're ever like, I used to coach football athletes, right, and if you want them to change direction, the first thing they got to do is turn their head. Don't ever try to turn your hips and keep your head this way. Boom, you got to turn the head, and then the hips will follow, right, because there is a working relationship between what's going on at the atlas, right, up here, C1. And the, uh, and the sacrum, boom, right? So they work together. And I have this theory, which I, I think is, I didn't make it up. I think there are other people that talk about it. But once again, where these diaphragms are. So whatever's going on down here is going to affect up here. Whatever's happening up here is going to affect down here. And that's scientifically shown stuff, but I'm not going to, you can look it up. And then the ocular band, right across here, boom, right? The eyes, the muscles around here, right? Forehead, is the part of it, and then across, boom. So those are the straps. Within each strap, you'll notice there are, or between each strap are what are called segments. So we got segments, you could call this segment one, segment two, segment three, segment four, segment five, segment six, segment seven. I think that's how it goes, or maybe you go up one. But there, each one is associated, yeah, I got those, I got that wrong. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm just gonna call this eight for now. But anyway, you'll notice that there are segments in between each. Each one of those segments, now this is really important because you might be asking yourself, well, how are these segments segmented? How did they come up to be? So of course now we have uh, evidence, proof, resources that point to the fact that these straps are here. And these straps being, uh, being facial, right? That's fascia. We know that the fascia is, it's, it's interesting because people are, I mean, like we're just beginning to start to pay attention to fascia. People like Ida Rolf really noticed this like in the 1930s, but people, I don't know, it just takes a long time for things to catch on. Almost hundred years later, we're recognizing that this, face, this fascia, it's connective tissue that is, that sort of is like a spider web, right? It webs its way through the muscular and nervous system. So it's, it's, it, it, it's affected and it, it's affected by, and it affects the nervous system. And of course it innervates and wraps around the muscle and then it can work also with the organ. It's like, it's just a web, right? That's why I guess this, they call this book, you know, the endless web. It's an endless web. It's a web and, and we're noticing it, right? And so they're, they got cadaver studies and stuff, right? I'm, you know, kind of just showing you, uh, there were, there are cadavers in this book, but I'm not going to find it right now. So it's like, yeah, they're studying it. I know this is true. So we know this is true. We know this is true, right? Because some of this stuff could seem sort of out there. Well, what we also know is true, and what is evident by observation, is that in between each one of these, there are these nerve bundles, bundles of nerve. If you look at, so I have, you know, I brought my anatomy book here. Uh, out, coming out of the spine, right? And this is just, this is the Atlas of Human Anatomy. There are these nerves that are associated. See, look at this one, they're coming out of like C1 through C8, and then it's associated with the, uh, these glands, right? The larynx, the one below it, the heart, you see, boom. So these nerves, they come out and they're, and they're, and they're plexuses, meaning that they're like bundles, right? Where each one of them, if you just imagine like a tree, like a tree grows out of each one of them. So there's the, there's the main nerve and then branch off and they branch off into the muscle, they branch off into the, into the organs and so on and so forth. And so with each one of these segments, we have a number one up here, right? I guess we'll call this eight or seven. You know, we'll get it right eventually. I don't think the matter, I don't think the numbers matter, right? But the point is that there are seven bands and then there are these eight sections. Yeah, so I did get it right. Cerebral cortex. So we got the cerebral cortex, which is the brain, and then also right out of it are like the uh, ocular nerves, right? Optic, optic nerves, they call it, right? So we got the optic nerve, we got the eyes, we got everything up here, boom, right? Someone, someone commented in one of my videos before I was talking about the importance of the eyes, right? Of course. Uh, and he says that the brain, the eyes are an exposed part of the brain. And you think about it, it really is. Think about how sensitive the eyes are. And of course it's locked right into the brain. I mean, it shoots right back. You, know, you got the opti optic nerve and it's like, the, it's like the eyes sort of just like jut out from the brain. <laughs> so it's like a part of the brain, right? And so, and of course, this is way more nuanced than I'm making it. So you got the cerebral cortex, you get the, the carotid plexus, right? Because you get your carotid artery. Carotid plexus, right? Which is between C1 and C2. Carotid, which is associated with this area here, right? The jaw, that segment. Pharyngeal, right? I, I, so I assume that has something to do with the pharynx, right? Larynx, pharynx. Pharyngeal. And I think these, I as I look through different anatomy books, like it almost seems like there are different names that are associated with it. It just depends on who you're talking to. Cause there's also like the brachial plexus. And I don't know if that's sort of different. Maybe it is a different one, but they're all very close. So I'm doing the best that I can here. It's pharyngeal, right? C3 through C7, right? So when I say C3 through C7, I'm talking about vertebra, right? Vertebrae. And so you have the cardiac plexus, pulmonary cardiac, 
What do you think that's associated with? The pulmonary and cardiac system, right? The heart and the lungs. The solar plexus, right? Which is associated with this segment, right? Cut off. The sacral, which is, so T9 through T12, right? That's a plexus. And then you got the coccygeal plexus. And then down below, legs. Right, so what do, you, what do you call that nerve that goes down through the leg? Like your sciatic, sciatic nerve, nerve root, um, or all kinds of nerves that shoot down and then just, of course, keep going. So we're, I mean, it's the strangest thing. I often say that like, we're basically like, if this is a flower, and it's so funny, like this is the flowering of human consciousness, is the brain, right? And everything else is like a root system. It's like we're literally, if you look at like a tree and this is like the flower, or look at a plant and the flower, it's like this is the root system that is fed by and feeds the flowering. I'm being a little poetic here. So these are the segments. So we're looking at anatomy now, but we're gonna move, we're gonna move on here because, you know, uh, I, I often say the body is the mind. And I don't need to prove that, but I want to demonstrate to you how real that is. It doesn't, I mean, a kid could tell you, it's not that hard to figure this stuff out, but sometimes we overthink stuff. So I want to show you, just demonstrate to you how if we're, if we're talking about neosomatotypes and we're wanting to work with our neosomatotype, we're wanting to work with the shape of our body, and we want to go back to the root of how this body took, it, took on its shape. And of course, there's things like genetics, epigenetics, injury, trauma, experiences. So we go from you know, concrete to sort of existential things and how they all work together. We have to take notice as to where those existential, spiritual, mental, sensational situations have occurred or are still trapped or you know, right, still holding in our body through our nervous system like me when I was praying today, right? What was this all about, right? I could, I could spend all day psychoanalyzing myself about why I was doing this, right? But in a way, it's like, it's pretty obvious. I'm like, you know, I got, I'm a little bit of a fighter, right? So I'm sitting there, kneeling down to pray. And it's like, yo, Elliot, relax. You, there's no threat. Nobody, nobody's trying to fight you. Take your, take your food. <laughs> Right? And, a lot, and like, so that sounds kind of silly. <laughs> and it is silly. But we still do it. And it comes from, it, it's latent leftover stuff from traumatic experiences. Right? And once again, you know, we could try to psychoanalyze all day long or we can work with the body. And so I'm a body worker. So it's like, hey, what can we do to relieve the body, release the tension, and then free up the mind? As soon as I released the tension in my body while I was down in that kneeling position, my mind relaxed and I was available to pray. So what are each one of these segments associated with? It doesn't take much to figure this stuff out, but I'm going to demonstrate to you. So thinking, of course, the cerebral cortex, thinking. And it's so funny because if you try to like, even like I just did this right now, right? Like if you're thinking, what do you do? Right? A lot of times we like furrow the brow, right? And uh, like, if we're, try if we're trying to concentrate, what do we do, right? Like, do this, hmm, hmm, right? And so it's associated with thinking. The muscles are associated with the thinking, but the, of course the brain is associated with that. that. This is just very broad. This is very sweeping and it's very limited, the things I'm talking about here, because this is associated with also seeing, right? Eyes associated with light, right? Sleep-wake cycles. It's associated with, um, all kinds of other things. Hormones, right? You got your pineal gland that's associated with it and other, other glands in the brain. Like, I don't know them off the top of my head, but they, like, they affect, like master glands. They affect other hormones in the body. A lot of what's happening down here hormonally is happening up here, right? So thinking, hearing, the carotid plexus. So this is, this is hearing, but it's also speaking, right? Even though this one's I put with speaking, but it's also associated with it. There's sort of a crossover. Hearing, jaw, stress is associated with it, right? Uh, the teeth, any, anything is associated with the mouth, the teeth, the jaw, crying emotions, right? The emotion of crying, 
Like, if you ever notice, like to cry, this area is has to be relaxed. Somebody who's got a tight jaw, or tight lip, is somebody who like they bite down and they won't, won't allow themselves to, to cry. If you look at a baby, look at a kid, and like the kid is trying to hold back its tears, watch its mouth and the chin. I remember my brother when I was a kid. I, I don't know why it sticks in my head, but he had like a he had like a fat chin. I remember every time he was upset or he was crying, his whole chin would dimple up. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I was like, oh man, here come the tears. And it's just like, Brr. and so these muscles would just like tense up because he's trying to hold it in. And then it was like, bah! and then just the floodgates would come. Imagine you're holding what's going on up here because the tears don't come if the jaw don't release. How strange is that? The tears won't come if the jaw doesn't release. So the jaw has to release. And that's why Wilhelm Reich did a lot of jaw work. A lot of jaw work. A lot of emotions are held back by the jaw. Uh, so it's not just hearing, right? I'm just giving you, you know, some stuff here, but you could, you could bite, you could clamp down. In other words, not make yourself receptive to hearing what somebody has to say, right? Ever catch yourself? Notice if like somebody is talking to you in a way that's kind of like aggressive and you, you want to fight back, but you know, you can't like, you know, something like that, an authority figure or something like that. Notice what's happening to your jaw. Kind of like doing this on the inside. Also, man, it's so pat. You you notice people's passive aggressiveness when you start to pay attention to this stuff. Uh, one of which, a couple of them, man, that I notice in people in my life. Uh, my dad. My dad loves talking. He loves chewing people out. He's always got something to say, but he also chews gum a lot. So he, he just he, he's sort of discharging the tension in his jaw by chewing gum. So like, if my dad is somewhere like you know where he's trying to be a, a nice guy. <laughs> Because he, you know, he, he, there's, he, you know, there's stuff going on in his head that he wants to say. He would be chewing gum. So we'll be out of like an outing or something around like people who are strangers and they're doing weird things and saying, saying strange things. And my dad's chewing gum. It's because like he's saying it on the inside, but it's not coming out. Chewing gum. Yawning. Both Colleen, I catch her doing it. And my, a former business partner of mine, I'll just leave it at that. That the minute I start saying something that it doesn't resonate or is um, they don't want to receive it, right? Or the, it's just it's just not interesting to them. <sighs> I used to know I know when Colleen's conversation is about to end, if she's on the phone with somebody and she starts going, oh, "All right, well." I think my daughter Emerson does the same thing too. It's like a fake yawn. <sighs> And that means, okay, it's about done. And I remember somebody else doing that too. Like, it just, uh, that means, okay, wrap it up. But they don't know that they're doing it. They're totally unconscious that they're doing it. They're just yawning because, like, that's, the, it's, a, it's a neurotic holding pattern, but these are also neurotic reactions. Totally unconscious. Yawn, right? So, the minute, I, and I would try to point these things out to people, but they think I'm nuts when I say it. Like, okay, I get it. You're yawning, right? They don't even know that they're yawning. It's the funniest thing. So that's associated with this. Connecting, you know, I'm kind of like trying to stay legit, but also like, oh, we do connect through our heart. You know, I was thinking about this, like I was going to use the word love, right? Because like every, we all, it's not just a poetic aphorism that like the heart is love. And when you say love, you say heart, you say heart and love. Like why? Why the heart? Because what does the heart do? The heart pumps connection to the whole body. It's pumping blood to your whole body. Your whole body is connected through the life-giving blood that the heart pumps. The heart keeps your whole body in this fluid flow of love. Like there's, that's love moving through your whole body, constantly connecting. And what do you know also, when you're connecting with someone, your body will pump more blood to that area. You notice if you're connecting with somebody sexually, what happens to the organs? They engage, they engorge with blood. If you're, in, if you're going to connect with somebody through your lips, what ends up happening? The, blood, the lips, the, the areas that have like a really thin skin start to, you could, t you could tell it through those areas because they start to flush, they start to flush, they turn full of blood. Right? And that's connect because you're, you're getting ready to connect. Like the blood is almost like it wants to reach out to that person like because it's love. Like, man, I love, right? And 
you know, love is a strange thing because love is also associated with lust. When you lust someone, there's an element of love that's associated with it and you feel it in your heart. You, it, I know, because that's a low, I know it sounds crazy, it's, it's a more primal love, it's a more of an of a animal love, but it's love nonetheless because physiologically it's the same thing. When you lust for someone, even if you, you know, you're, you know, people who are real promiscuous and they're just, you know, riding the carousel, they'll say, or, you know, having a lot of partners, in each one of those instances, there is a love response in the body, all the blood and all the hormones and all, it does that love thing, but conceptually or, or spiritually, there's no love there. That's why it's so dangerous to share your body with too many different people because that love is a legitimate connection, but it's a distorted, perverted connection because there's no, it, it gives the sense that there's love, right? There's an, it's unconscious. Your, your, your sympathetic branch of your autonomic nervous system is doing the love thing but it's not really there because as human beings, we're not just boning creatures, which some people make you want to believe that we're just bonobos and we're just, you know, free sex. But that's why so many people are injured today. And that's why, you know, relationships aren't working between men and women. Neither here nor there, but that's associated with the heart, associated with connecting. Solar plexus, right? It's your will. It's your I am presence. When somebody says like, you know, point to yourself, what do you do? You go like this. Point to yourself, right? Nobody points to themselves like this. You point to yourself like this. You point to, to your who you are. This is, a, you're the sun, right? This is, I can get real poetic, but I'm going to stop. But this is the sun of your being. This is the sun of God. This is the reason why they call it solar. Partially because it also branches out like a, the, the nerves that, that leave the solar plexus go like the sun, like they go, it goes all over the place. And it's like our main diaphragm, right? Where we breathe from. But that also means that it's like, if you're bringing your whole self to something, even the word self, soul, think about the word soul, soul, solar, solar. You're, this is like the seat of the soul. Ah, there's a lot associated with it, but you, it's, I'm giving it willing. I'm talking about willing because if you do something and you're unwilling, how do you even look? How do you even look? A lot of this stuff is postural too. How do you look? Uh, the guy looks like he's unwilling. Like my son, my, he's, he, I call him outside to do some yard work or something. My dad does. And he doesn't want to. He just look like this. But if you call him for some ice cream, he looks like this. Willing. Oh, yeah, I'm willing. They're like, yeah, let me help you. But if you don't want to do something, what happens? Uh, the sun shuts down. <laughs> So you could, you could, this stuff is evidenced in someone's, when somebody says like good vibes, yeah, what's, what's the frequency? Willing, unwilling. Even the, even the heart. They say that the heart is the largest electro, electromagnetic field in the body. And they have like special cameras that can show this stuff, right? Whether you believe in it or not, it's interesting. You can't deny it. Like it's there. Like, look, what is that? Right? Then call it whatever you want. Sacral is associated with desiring. Pretty simple one. And of course, like I said, this is just, this is very brief. This is, I'm not really going very deep down this rabbit hole at all today. But sacral, desiring, right? When you are in desire, I'm talking about sexual desire, this area is stimulated. And of course, being. Being is associated with the root system, your legs, right? Where you stand, where you are, put my foot down. When somebody says, I put my foot down, a lot of these like aphorisms, or, like these sayings, they're so, they're so apt, they're so legit. Like I put my foot down, what does that mean? This is where I am, I'm not moving. This is where I be. This is where I'm, people will even say it, you know, standing my ground. What does a tree do? It stands its ground. You ain't moving that tree, right? That means that it's being. It's being right there. And you decide where you're going to be. How do you get to where you are? Your legs take you there. So where you, where you stand is where you be. I be there. I be here. I be anywhere. Why? Because my legs took me there. And so that's it. Just, uh, just trying to fill in the gaps for a lot of things we've been talking about here in terms of neosomatotypes, bioenergetics. A lot of cool things. Don't want to leave any stones unturned. And this, of course, straps, segments, and sensation is a big stone that we overturned today. I hope this was helpful to you. Comment down below. Follow me if you like this. Talk soon. Done.